there's three weeks left after today, so hang in there. I think we can make it. A lot of lessons, Randy, the last week of class. Last day of class, yeah. I'm not, I'm not giving up on them. Unfortunately, that means like uh, this exam, 310 and uh, 354 all on the last day of class. All right. Oh, well. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, you, you have six weeks to recover. Um, okay. I, um, so we've been talking about magnetic fields in this chapter, magnetostatics in particular. Uh, today I want to look at, and, and we, we've used Ampere's circuital law now to, to, to have a, an equation for the magnetic uh, field intensity, H. We used Gauss's law for uh, magnetic fields. That was the, the del dot B is always equal to zero. And then uh, um, that was the point form. And then uh, we've used uh, uh, Ampere's circuital law in integral form. Now to find the H field in problems that have a lot of symmetry. So So today I want to look at the differential form or the point form, and then a work through an example. I'm going to have you guys do some work, so make sure you have your sheet ready with that has all the, the the laws, all the vector calculus rules, and then I'm going to look briefly at uh, boundary conditions. Again, there I want to work uh, a couple of examples. So let you guys um work through some examples i'm not going to derive the boundary conditions he has the, the derivations in the textbook they're a little long i'm just going to give them to you and we'll see how we can use them to work some problems i will derive the point form of Ampere's circuital law uh, just because it's relatively quick and easy um, stokes theorem says that this contour integral on the left hand side of the integral form of Ampere's circuital law is equal to and the circulation of the H field can be found by also um, uh, doing the surface integral over the curl of the field. Again, this is a, this is a vector calculus law. So it, it's true for any field, not nothing special about this, you know, nothing about this applies only to the H field. This, this is true in general. So the, the, the contour here is a closed contour or a loop. The surface is, you know, the, the, the bubble that's enclosed by that contour. Uh, so we can replace the left-hand side uh, of Ampere's uh, circuital law with the surface integral. Um, we want to also write the right-hand side as a surface integral. As an integral over current density. And remember the current density is amps per meter squared. So we enter, um, integrate that um, you know, over the surface area, the cross-sectional area of the entire surface. We get the current enclosed. So equating these two new integrals, the surface integral over the curl is equal to the surface integral 
over the current density. And this, this has to be true for any surface or any contour. So it implies Del cross H is equal to J. And this is the form we're after. So Maxwell's equations are given in two forms, typically an integral form and then also in a differential form. And this is the form that applies to a magnetostatics. There's a slight modification you have to make. Uh, for time varying fields. But it says that the, the current density at any point is equal to the curl of the magnetic field intensity. Okay. So, and we've already worked some examples where we've found H. So let's go back and look at those. So let's evaluate. Uh, the curl of H for a current carrying wire. Um, and so this is the problem we worked before. This is the Z axis. Um, this is an infinite wire. I'm showing just a section of it that is carrying a current I. The wire has a radius A and then based on the direction of the current. Uh, so we use Emperor's circuital law in integral form to find H for that particular problem. And in particular, we found it's equal to, so there are two cases. There's an H field inside the wire and an H field outside the wire. Uh, inside the wire, it's proportional to the distance from the Z axis. So that's for rho less than A. And then outside the wire, again, it's B directed, and it's I over two pi rho. And so it's inversely proportional with, with that distance. So magnetic field intensity falls off with distance. Okay. For rho greater than A, so outside the wire. We'll do this one first. That's actually the, the bottom one here. Pull out your formula sheet and write down the, the expression for the curl here. And that's that's appropriate for this coordinate system. Let me find my formula sheet. Because uh, there was some several people had some difficulty with this the last time on our last exam. Give you a few minutes to do that and solve for it.
Okay. Um, I didn't give you enough time, but it looks like several of you did bring the sheet. Bring with you to class every time. Um, what coordinate system are we going to use? Cylindrical. Cylindrical. Okay. Um, and so you have to use the vector operations and cylindrical coordinates here and use the, the curl equation that's appropriate. And I'll write it down here. It's a nasty long thing, but I want to write down the whole thing so that we can see what falls away. But you, know, you, you can't use the uh, Cartesian one unless you convert the field to Cartesian coordinates, which means converting this unit vector into x, y, z unit vectors, and then uh, uh, converting the row component into x, y, z uh, uh, components. So, but the expression here is, uh, and this is a vector row partial of a, z with respect to phi minus partial of a, z with respect to z minus plus partial of a rho with respect to z minus partial of a z with respect to rho and then plus z hat one over rho partial of with respect to rho of rho a phi minus one over rho partial of rho. And, then, and again, that's a long, nasty thing. Okay. Um, you, you hope for some simplification. Indeed, we have some. Again, we're looking at just the outside wire. So uh, looking at this expression, what's the only component of H that we have? Actually, all of I wrote this right off the formula sheet, but all of these should be H's. Sorry. What is this HC, HB, H row stuff that's in here? What do, what do, what do those represent? They represent the corresponding component in that direction. Okay, they don't mean, you know, uh, uh, if it depends on rho, the only component we have here is an HV component. The HV component does depend on rho. It could also depend on z, it could depend on phi. But in this formula, the only thing we have is an HV component. So the, so the z component is going to be gone as is the row component. So that only leaves us with two terms here involving H phi. If we look at our H phi, it only depends on rho. So this partial derivative with respect to Z would also be gone. So fortunately, this whole mess has simplified to us for us. It's just got a z component and it's one over rho actually and because it only depends on rho i can actually it doesn't depend on two variables i can change the partial to uh, an ordinary derivative this is derivative with respect to rho and now i'm going to but it says not the derivative of just h v, it's the derivative of rho times h v. So now that's that's in the formula. Rho times h v So are there any questions where any of those terms have come from? So what's what's that going to be equal to? The derivative of that term, that inner term in parentheses. What's going to happen here? We've got rho divided by rho. 
So the rows are going to cancel. I'm going to have the derivative with respect to row of a constant, right? So this is, I'll write it one more time. One over rho, the derivative with respect to rho now of i over two pi, which is zero. So this implies that the current density outside the wire at any point from Ampere's secure the wall is zero. Well, of course it is. We're outside the wire. There is no current at any point outside the wire, right? That's what Ampere's secure wall here tells us. Del cross H is equal to J at any point. And this problem we're working, we've only got a density, a current density inside the wire. Now this is at a particular point, into any point, but if there is no current, there's no current density, and the curl of H is zero. Okay. Now, don't make the mistake of saying, oh, there's no current density outside the wire, so H is zero. That's not true. H is given by this expression. It's just that the curl of H is zero outside the wire. So again, it's, it's not really a formula. This, this leads to a differential equation that we can solve for H. It doesn't give us H directly. It relates the curl of H to the current density. Now, so let's look inside the water. And here we can kind of guess the answer. This says inside the wire, the curl of H should be equal to the current density. And the problem was set up, we've got a current I flowing through this wire of radius A. So the current density would be I divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. It's amps per meter squared. Okay, so it should be I over this cross-sectional area is pi A squared. That's the result we should get. Okay, so now, Uh, same curl formula inside the wire. We still only have the feed component. It's only a function of road still. So all these terms we have here, six terms, five of them are still zero. Four of them are zero because there's relate to Z or row components, which are zero. This one is zero, even though we've got a feed component, it's not a, it's not a function of Z. So that partial derivative goes away. So we're left with the same term from one over rho dd rho of rho and then now the only thing that's different inside the wire it's i rho 2 pi a squared one over rho so here now the previous one in the previous case, the rows canceled. I had the derivative of a constant. Here I got i over 2 pi a squared, but now the rows don't cancel, I get rho squared. But the derivative of rho squared with respect to rho is just two rho. So my twos will cancel and I'll get i over i rho over pi a squared, right? Derivative of row squared is two row. So my twos cancel, but I've got this one over row outside. So this is the result we get from the curl. So that implies inside the wire that the current density would be Z over I pi A squared, okay. which it is. Okay. Not only do we get the magnitude, it's the current divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire, 
but we also get the direction of the current density. It's z directly. That's going to be a function of the fact that h is in a positive phi direction. If h had been going in the other direction, a negative phi direction, my current would be in the negative z direction, or my current density would be in the negative z direction. I would be directed down also. Mm -hmm. So any questions? Okay. Um, let's talk about boundary conditions. And here again, I'm, I'm going to just give you the condition um, and then we'll work. I want to talk a little bit about what it means. Okay. Um, this is a corresponding picture, of course, where we've got two regions. A may have different permeabilities would be the, the relative material property that we're interested in here. And the normal vector is the, is the normal unit vector is normal to the surface. And by definition and the derivation, it's defined as, as pointing from region two and to region one. Actually, it doesn't matter here because if you take the negative of that result, you get the same negative and zero, zero, but it does matter in the boundary condition for H. What this says is that the normal, so when we do this dot product, we get the component of a vector in the direction of that vector. We do a dot, it, or if it's a dot product with the unit vector, we get the component of the vector in, in the direction of that unit vector. So this doesn't allow us to find B completely, but it, it equates the B field on one side of the boundary to the normal component of the B field on the other side. And it says the normal component of B is continuous right continuous across a material boundary. It's unfortunate that you know, the vector notation makes it more complicated looking than, than that because that's the best we can do with our, our vector no, notation. Now, since H is one over mu B, if the mu's are different, you know, the, the, uh, we'll have a discontinuity in H and the normal component of H if the mu's are different. If the mu's are the same, then the normal component of H would also be continuous. So, so let's, We'll do an example. We'll have another a boundary condition on the tangential component, which will allow us to find the entire field across the boundary. So here, the material boundary at the xy plane, and then just below the surface of the, so I'm, I'm saying that's it as equal zero minus. Normally, you know, our fields would be functions of coordinates, but our B field here in material two is given by four plus Z10 micro Tesla or micro Weber's per meter squared. So more generally, it might be a function of position, but here just below the surface, it's equal to that everywhere. So X, Y, and Z, 
So here I'm talking about yeah, it's really some material boundary. Let's say the relative permeability here is two in region two and it's equal to one or mu would be equal to mu zero in region one. So they really got some, you can think of, think of it as the floor. And our, our interface is the floor. And I'm giving you the magnetic field just below the floor. So what would be the normal component of this vector? normal to the floor or perpendicular to the floor. Yeah, it'd be the Z component, right? So we know already that B1 has to be, have a Z10 component. We don't know what the X or Y components are. So the, 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 the formal math would be, let B1 equal X hat BX, plus y hat by plus z hat bz. And then, so n dot b1 minus b2, n hat here for this particular problem is z hat. And appropriate coordinate system here is Cartesian coordinates. You know, if it were a cylinder or a sphere, and then we're talking about the, the boundary between a sphere and the surrounding material, um, then uh, spherical coordinates would be appropriate. This is n dot. You could, you could get here, this is equal to zero, or equivalently, n dot b1 is equal to n dot b2. But since n hat is equal to z hat. If we take this dot product, n hat dot b1 is just the bz component. That's all we get. Z dot x is zero, z dot y is zero, z dot z, z hat dot z hat is, is one. n dot b2, and that's just the Z component that would be 10 microtesla. So what this tells us is immediately BZ is equal to 10 microtesla. That's all this boundary condition tells us. It just gives us the normal component. So all, all that we have at, at this point is that B1 is x hat bx plus y hat by plus z hat 10 microtesla. That comes from this boundary condition where the normal component is of the B field is continuous. Now, if it were a cylinder and the cylinder were aligned along the z axis, what component would be continuous? What's the normal component to our cylinder? To the, to the sides of the cylinder, to the circular side. So here's my Z axis. So let's, let's say I had a different problem. I'm talking about the side. What is what what's the unit vector that's perpendicular to the side? So it's, it's going to be pointing in this direction, right? You know, straight out from the side. Now it varies depending on that's row hat. Right? 
we're talking about the top and bottom surfaces, it would be Z, Z hat there or minus Z hat on the bottom. If I were talking about a, a sphere that, were, that was centered at the origin, what's the appropriate normal to the surface or perpendicular to the surface? It's uh, in terms of a unit vector. So like this is row hat. So what's the corresponding vector? So this is a sphere. Now I've got this thing pointing out, not just as we go around, but pointing out perpendicularly from the, from the sphere. Okay, what's that direction? It's our hat. Right? That's the one that goes from the origin out to the point and then continues on. So this normal would be an R hat. Now, if it were like a hemisphere and you know, sitting, I cut it in half and we're just sitting right on the XY plane, then on the bottom surface, that would normal would be Z hat. Okay? Or if I sliced it along the uh, ZX plane, so I had a flat wall I was running into, then the normal coming out would be X hat on that side. Still on the, on the spherical side, it would still be R hat. There you get a mixture of coordinate systems though. Okay, so that, that, that becomes a little, little trickier. Now this also tells us, we also have, um, uh, since H is equal to one over mu B, this is always true. What we have is H2, and we were given B2 completely. I'm just gonna write it in terms of mu, mu2 is two mu zero. I'm not gonna put in the number for mu zero, but, but H2 would be one over mu zero X hat two plus Z hat 10. And then this would be, that was micro Tesla. This would be micro amperes per meter for H2. Okay. That's going from the given B field and just dividing by, by the permeability in the material. Thank you. Because 10 divided by 2 is 5. Right. Now, I don't have a complete expression for B1. I don't have Bx and By yet. But H1 would be 1 over mu1 B1 which is one over mu zero B1, because in the problem, the relative permeability of material one is one. So the permeability would be mu zero. And I don't have a complete expression for H1 yet, but I do have one over mu zero. And then I call these X, X hat BX plus Y hat BY plus Z hat 10. And again, this would be microamperes per meter for H1. Now notice, and this is what I what I meant by the discontinuity in H if the permeabilities are different. On one side here, it's five divided by mu zero. On the other side, my H field is 10 divided by mu zero. So it changes, it's discontinuous. The B field is continuous, 10 and 10. That's what this says, what this equation says, you know, what the mathematical formula says in terms of, of the field of vectors. Fortunately, we, there is a boundary condition on the tangential component And that allows us to find a complete vector. 
you know, if we know if we know the field on one side of the surface, we've got a we've got a boundary condition on the normal component. If we have a boundary condition on the tangential component, for the tangential component. Now here. And this, this is a little harder to interpret because it involves a cross product. It's easiest to state in terms of the H field, though, instead of the B field. You could, you could write this in terms of the B field, you know, just uh, substitute in um, you know, uh, mu B for uh, mu H, B is equal to mu h, so we could substitute in um, uh, one over mu b for each of those, just the way we could write this in terms of our h fields. Just substitute in mu, uh, uh, mu h, mu 1h here and mu 2h here. But we just write this in terms of the b field because it leads to this continuity in the b field. And it's easier to, to state in English. This one, it's easier to state in terms of the h field. Could rewrite it in terms of the B field. Now, this one, let me draw a picture here, show you what this is talking about. One, and the, the normal is from region one to region two. And This is a surface current density. Just like for charge, we had volume charge density, surface charge density, line charge density. Actually, for currents, we deal with two types a current density, amperes per meter squared, and then a, a surface current density, which is amperes per meter. So this has the same units actually as H, which is required by the equation since n is unitless. And this says, well, let me write it down in, so JS is a surface current density so normally when we see J it has amperes per meter squared, but JS is a surface current density. But what the formula says, you know, there can be a, now N cross, N dot gives us the normal component, N cross with a vector would give us the tangential, what's perpendicular to the, the normal. So this would give us, the tangential component of the H fields, and it's relating the tangential components on both sides of the boundary. It's really saying if there is a JS, then the discontinuity in the, in the, in the tangential component is equal to that, that uh, uh, surface current density. But it's normally stated like this if there is no surface current density, the tangential component, then the right-hand side would be zero. The tangential component of H is continuous. Now, since B is equal to mu H, there would be a, a discontinuity or a jump in the B field. But if the, and if there's a surface current, then there's usually, then there would be a discontinuity in the H field. And then generally a, a discontinuity in the B field, although depending on the mu's, that could be set up so that actually there's uh, continuity in the, the tangential component. This relates just to the tangential component. So,
continue the previous example. But assuming there is no surface current. Now, again, we can get there very quickly, and it, it takes longer to do the math than it does to kind of intuit the result. Okay. If there is no surface current density, that means we've got continuity in the tangential component of our H field. Now, here in this problem, our normal was in the Z direction. So the tangential component would be any vector in the x, y, you know, that had x, that, that, y, that was in the x, y plane. Now, uh, B2, where'd it go? B2 only has an x component. So what this tells us is B1 would have the same x component. There wouldn't be a y component. There wouldn't be a Y component unless there was like a JSY. Okay. Sorry, not Bs, but where'd my H formulas go? H2 and H1. The XY component here has to be the same across my boundary. Since there is no Y component in H2, there's no Y component in H1. Okay, so, so what I have over here I had H2 already. Um, it was one over mu zero, two and five, one over mu zero, x bar two plus C5. That was microamperes per meter. Because of this boundary condition, I know this component stays the same. Now, it doesn't tell me anything about the normal component, but I've already got that. That was E10. X2 plus C hat 10 meter. This then allows me to get B1, you know, multiply by mu1, mu1 is mu0. Micro amperes per meter. That's kind of the way to get there without doing any math. The, the, The math solution is to go back and, and from the boundary condition, now, since the surface current is zero, but you know, if we look at my expression for, for H1 over here, my normals in the Z direction, so let me, let me write it down. H1 was one over mu zero. And then I had Bx plus y, by plus z10 microamperes per meter. N cross H1 would be, now N is Z. What's, what's Z cross X? You remember the little circle? Yeah, Z cross X is Y. So this would become BX over mu zero. What's Z cross Y? It's minus x. You got to get one around the circle the other direction, right? Minus x 
dy over u0. And that, that's just backwards. So the circles x, y, z, x cross y, z, z cross x is y. So z, z cross y is x, z cross x is y, that's right. And then z cross y is minus x, oh, that's right. What's z cross z? That's zero. So units here actually wouldn't change. N cross H2. Um, here's H2. Uh, I'll just have the, the uh, ZX component, which is Y. And that's two over mu zero microamperes per meter. So I know, know there's a couple different units or mu's there that appear. You'll have to figure out by context whether it's a prefix, as in microamperes per meter, or whether I'm talking about permeability. Okay. Now, the, the boundary condition here says that these have to be equal, which means by has to be zero, because there is no x component here in n cross h2. That means by has to be zero. It means bx has to be equal to two. Okay. So my, my boundary condition here of n cross h1 minus h2 equal to zero in this case implies that bx is equal to two and back to tesla here micro tesla or that bx over mu zero is, is two over mu zero but i just went ahead and canceled out the so that means now I think I've got um, all my pieces. Uh, we were given B2 and H2. Um, we already have B1. It was plus Z10 microamps per meter. And then now we have H1. Uh, yeah, it's one over mu zero. Two plus Z ten microamps per meter. My, sorry, my ten was running out of ink, but we didn't see that. So now applying both boundary conditions, I'm able, you know, knowing the vector field on one side. Now often, you know, I, I simplified the problem here a little bit because I gave you B1 kind of as a constant vector, or uh, B2 as a constant vector. Where'd it go? Right here. If it's a function of, you know, maybe X and Z or Y, you would have to evaluate it, you know, right below the surface at z equal to zero. And then say, well, this is this is what it is just on the other side of just on the other side of the surface. Any questions? All right, let's that's it for today. Thank you.